uh, just a brief information before Marcia starts her uh, her lecture. I think it's good to take a picture while everyone is still here. So we can also have some documentation uh, for the faculty. Okay, so... Uh, 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 sorry, yeah. uh, Dia, are we going to do it now while people are still coming or can we do it after Ibu Sulis delivers her speech instead? Yeah. Okay, I mean the, the picture? Yeah, the yeah. picture. Yeah. yeah, it's after Ibu Sulis delivering her yes. speech. Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, Okay, so uh, selamat sore, uh, kui morga, uh, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, salam sejahtera, namung budaya, salam kebajikan mm -hmm. untuk kita semua. First okay. of all, uh, selamat sore, our distinguished dean of the law faculty, Universitas Indonesia, Dr. Edmond Makarim, our distinguished head of the study program, law, society, and development. Professor Sulistiawati Irianto, and our distinguished guests all the way from Leiden, <laughs> Professor Marcia van der Waude, our distinguished professors, colleagues, and students. Welcome at the public lecture by Professor van der Waude, titled Studying Law in Society, Interdisciplinary Endeavor. One of a series of lectures that are organized this week in the frame of our law faculty's 96th Dies Natalis. It is a great honor to welcome Professor Van der Waude at our faculty on this special occasion. Before we turn to Professor Van der Waude's uh, public lecture, our Dean of our law faculty, Dr. Edmond Makarim, will first open this event, followed by some opening remarks uh, of Professor Sulistiawati Irianto as the head of our department. So I would like to welcome our Dean to deliver his opening speech. Silahkan, Bang Edmond. Okay. Thank you very much, Teresia. Uh, Assalamualaikum, selamat sore, good evening. Salam, sal salam, om swastiastu, namo budaya, salam kebajikan. God bless for us all. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome Professor Marcel van der Waude on this very special occasion. Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia and Leiden Law School and the Van der Waude Institute, Leiden University, have had a close relationship since the establishment of Reichel School in 1924. The foundation of today's Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia, countless forms of collaboration in the legal field have been carried out by our founding fathers and mothers who pioneered the study of, study of law in Indonesia. The academic relations between Leiden Law School and Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia has lasted for many decades, involving many generations of legal scholars and this relationship. I hope we will still continue many years to come. In the year 2006, Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia, and the Van Pallenhoven Institute conducted the first ever social legal studies course series, which have put studying law with interdisciplinary approach on the agenda, or back on the agenda of many universities in Indonesia. This event has triggered a revival and rejuvenation of social legal studies in Indonesia. Please, dear. <laughs> Later on, in the year 2014, the cooperation was continued with the Building Block Program, with focus not only on social legal studies, but also traditional legal fields like agrarian law, civil law, and labor law. Through this program, Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia became a hub for a collaboration among a number of law schools in the Netherlands and some law schools in Indonesia on a variety of legal disciplines. Today, many young Indonesian scholars have taken up socio-legal studies abroad, including to Leiden Law School. The most recent cooperation was the second IANG conference on socio-legal studies, which, which held in August last year at Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia. The program was attended by a Dutch delegation led by the Dean of Leiden Law School, Prof. Joanne van der Loon, 
and the head of Van Fallen Van Fallenhoven Institute, Professor Adrian Butner, who both as who both also gave a public lecture to our students. Today we have the honor present Prof. Professor Marcia van der Waude as one of our guest lectures at our 1960th this Natalis celebrations. Her presence is at our DS Natalis show our mutual appreciation of our long-standing cooperations and relationship between law faculty Universitas Indonesia and Leiden Law School. The topic that Prof. Marcio will deliver today, the interdisciplinary approach to the study of law, is a topic about the subdiscipline that always has been part legal studies. Yes, its position remains subject to major discussion, including at Leiden University and Law Faculty Universitas Indonesia. I just want to add some information. Our last visit to Leiden is last year also. Uh, me and other dean from other faculties at the time had visit Leiden and uh, Van Vallenhoven Institute as well. We discussed some uh, topics and we would like to seek any further collaboration. Some years ago also, our the Technology Law Center, the Technology Law Research Centers, were also have a memorandum of understanding with the Electronic Law Center from Leiden Law School. At the time, we were having a discussion on electronic identification and authentication system with some colleagues of Professor Simon van der Hoff as the chairman at that time. And now uh, we hear that uh, the, the chairman now, uh, Bart Custer, as the directors. We will also would like to seek any research collaborations in the future to exploring any aspect on ICT law. It is in the spirit of our, go, our ongoing cooperation that the Faculty of Law of Universitas Indonesia invite, invites Professor Marcia van der Waarde of Leiden Law School to deliver her speech on the importance of the interdisciplinary approach to law in celebrating our, our Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia 1960s this Natalis celebration. Thank you very much for your kind to uh, share uh, any information with us and your time. Thank you. And I will send back the time to Therese. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So, terima kasih. Thank you so much, uh, Pak Dekan. Uh, and now I would like to invite Professor uh, Sulistiawati Irianto to deliver her opening remarks. Silahkan, Ibu. Thank you, Dia. Let me read my uh, paper. Best to Professor Marcia van der Wode. It is a great honor to you to be here for this opportunity to make a welcome from your heart. Good morning for Professor Marcia and my colleagues, um, but Ms. Reims and other colleagues from Leiden. Good evening, everyone. The respectful Professor Marcia van der Wode, our Dean Dr. Edmond Makarim, my colleagues of Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia, other colleagues from other university and institutions, students, and all of you in this virtual room. Please let me represent our study program of law, society, and development. We inherited from the founding fathers, mothers of this Faculty of Law to maintain some lecture teaching subject like legal anthropology, sociology of law, and study of law and economics. Together with my young colleagues, we have been doing interdisciplinary studies of law through teaching, research, publications, involving many students and colleagues from other faculties of law and legal institutions in this country. Why we should think more about interdisciplinary studies of law? The legal education curriculum will determine what kind of law graduates are produced. For the sake of the future of Indonesia, the demands are for law graduates who can respond to the practices and legal cases that continue to develop in society. It is important to study the matter of legal certainty 
but it should not abandon substantive justice, which is the essence of community justice. However, legal justice is not always synonymous with substantive justice because legal justice is more akin to procedural justice. How can we uphold the rule of law by continuing to promote community justice so that the rule of law does not become defective? However, law cannot be studied without studying the society and culture where it is located. What kind of legal education is needed for the future of Indonesia in order to create a strong rule of law, but at the same time with a perspective of justice of the underserved community? The operation of the law is related to other fields such as economic, social, political, cultural, and various other sectors. The implementation of law is very much interconnected with other fields. The law regulates what is and what is not allowed in human relations. True legal texts, the philosophies, and the spirit of justice are formulated as guidelines for community life or dispute resolutions. However, there is always a gap between legal norm as ideal goals and substantial justice in practice when in fact law is a determinant factor for almost all broad issues. To close this gap, the study of law requires an interdisciplinary perspective. Legal experts in certain fields should collaborate with experts in other fields of law. Social humanities scientists and pioneers of legal philosophers have long laid the foundation. Even the basis for interdisciplinarity of legal studies can be traced epistemologically. In interdisciplinary studies of law, like social legal studies, the substance of the problem being studied is legal issues, but explaining and answering it is not only in juridical normative term. We may also borrow the methodological approach of other sciences. This contribution of methods from other sciences and rich legal research method instead of eliminating its paradigmatic authority. Today, openness to science and digital technology for law graduate is also inevitable. First, it is driven by the need for a legal reform program. In general, throughout the world, the problems faced by the justice seeker regarding the judicial process are delays, lack of access, and corruption. Digital technology supports and ensures good administrative governance and judicial processes. The dark period of the judicial process as investigated by Professor Sebastian Pompe, in which nepotism, collusion, and corruption undermine the authority of the Indonesian court, so sorry to say, is still going on. Digital information and technology is also needed in the FED, evidentiary process in court trial through the use of video, audio, in court sessions, electronic reporting, video conferences for witnesses, and file storage. Today's crimes are growing, and the proof requires the health of science and technology because the punishment must be based on proof, investigative findings, and investigation that are accurate and precise so as not to go wrong in punishing people. In short, all the decision-making process in the trial require information technology in order to provide services in a fair and transparent manner. Digital technology may also be utilized for the lawmaking process in, in parliament in order to accommodate the reality and sense of justice of the community. Second, there will be a massive shift when 1 million conventional jobs are lost because they are replaced by artificial intelligence, including the legal profession, such as notaries and advocates. 
large law firms will collapse because corporation no longer want to pay for expensive advocate services which are replaced by digital applications while small law firms will merge. That, that's uh, Richard Saskin say about. However, on the other hand, as many as 1.7 million new profession will be born, will we accept this challenge with openness and new initiative? Although in a pluralistic Indonesian society, geographic and technological disparity are to be expected. So the shifting has taken on a different character from one place to another. The, there are some communities who already live in industrial technology 4.0, but there are still those who live and produce using simple technology. The challenge becomes greater because how can modern law coexist with customary law and oral traditions? The answer to this question can only be obtained if the legal education curriculum is more open to lectures on the knowledge of legal reality. The study of legal pluralism, for example, give us an understanding that legal centralism, which believes that the state law is the only law and applies uniformly to all people, is utopian. The daily reality of society is the social arenas where the intertwining of state law, customary law, relig religious law, and custom, which contest each other, but also influence and reproduce each other so that new laws are born. In today's global era, interlegal coexistence is increasingly complex with the presence of international law, especially in the field of human rights and good governance, adopted by national laws of many countries. The, con the convergence between the law from various directions to all directions is what causes the law to move, change, and legal change is a necessity. Finally, to accommodate the need of suitable legal curriculum, I will trace some questions in the following. To what extent are legal education managers open in formulating and implementing the curriculum? Is there enough space to enrich legal science with a new approach and methodology in order to analyze the development of legal practices more fundamentally? To what extent do interdisciplinary law studies have a place in the curriculum? The answer to this question will have an impact on the development of legal science and the future of legal enforcement in Indonesia. Hope this public lecture will give us enlightenment in answering this question. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Ya, terima kasih Ibu Sulis. Thank you so much. Uh, before we continue, uh, Professor Van der Wouden, I would like to introduce you to one of our professors who also uh, attending this uh, guest lecture this afternoon. So we welcome Professor Satya Arinanto. Selamat sore, Bapak. Uh, selamat sore. Good afternoon, nice. yeah, everybody. Yeah, thank you nice so much for yeah. coming. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think we can uh, continue with the photo session and uh, Zara will help us. So, uh, Ibu, Bapak, kawan-kawan semua, bolehkah menyalakan kameranya? So, if you don't mind, you please turn on the camera so we can take a picture together. So, it, it's a bit weird because we have several pages <laughs> of Zoom screens. Uh, yeah, Sarah, on your mark. Baik, halaman satu, Bapak Ibu. Page one. <laughs> Mbak Asti. Page two. Page three. The page five. And last page. Okay. 
Mas yang belum menyalakan video. <laughs> Okay, so uh, before we listen to the public lecture of today, please let me briefly introduce Professor Marcio van der Waude to you. Professor Marcio van der Waude is Professor of Law and Society at Leiden University, the Netherlands, and she holds her chair in the Van Vollenhoven Institute for Law Governance and Society. She is also affiliated with the Department of Criminology and Sociology of Law at the University of Oslo as a visiting professor and member of the Nordhaus, that is Nordic Hospitalities in a Context of Migration and Refugee Crisis Research Group. Her current work examines the politics and dialectics of terrorism or crime control, immigration control, and border control in the European Union and the growing merger of all three, also referred to as the process of crimigration. He is currently working on a five-year research project titled Getting to the Core of Crimigration that was funded by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, NWO. Professor van der Waude has published extensively in the forms of books, book chapters, and both in national and international peer-reviewed journals. So without any further ado, I now would like to invite Professor van der Waude to deliver her public lecture. Thank you very much, Dia. I'm going to try to share my, uh, my screen to um, get people to see the PowerPoint that I prepared. Um, if all is well, you should be seeing the PowerPoint, but not a Word document. Is that correct? So it's a PowerPoint, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, because yeah. I also have my notes in another screen and I wasn't sure how that worked. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the very kind, uh, the kind invitation. Um, I would like to start, of course, with also expressing my gratitude for uh, this honorable uh, task to give this very festive lecture to celebrate the 96th birthday of the University of Indonesia. And I would like to particularly thank uh, Dean Dr. Edmond Makarim, Professor Sulistiovati Sudi Irianto, and Dr. Dia for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to this lecture to mark the start of a longer collaboration between the Van Vollenhoven Institute and the Faculty of Law of the University of Indonesia, and in particular with our sister institute, the Department of Law, Society and Development. With the connections between our countries so strong, especially also with regards to our legal systems and with both countries facing similar challenges regarding, for instance, terrorism, migration, freedom of speech, gender and racial equality, and a lot of inequality, I see it as an uttermost importance to collaborate with scholars from UI where possible. I know, as I said, that these collaborations are already in place, and Dean Makarim also referred to many of these collaborations, but hereby also an open invitation from me personally especially in addressing, explaining, and seeking solutions for, or perhaps I should say adequate responses to, similar legal challenges our countries are facing, the role of social legal scholars and social legal scholarship is crucial. Only by understanding the dynamics between law and society and between law and human behavior, we can begin to do so. I'm going to share a quote with you. Um, I wish that all legal scholars would have a social legal background that would make them much better lawyers. This is what Dutch Supreme Court Justice Edgar Duperon said after reviewing the curriculum of the Law and Society Master's Program as it, as of the current academic year, is offered at Leiden Law School. Although the program is developed and coordinated by the Van Vollenhoven Institute, the reason why I'm quoting Justice Duperon is not to advertise the program as such, but more so to advertise and to underline the importance of the field of law and society. 
also known as the field of social legal studies. And I hope you can see me switching the slides because after uh, briefly introducing the field of law and society um, um, and the history, um, and I will show or I will illustrate that it has a long history and actually originates from legal scholars own frustration with the limitations of the doctrinal study of the law. I will introduce the figure of the so-called T-shaped legal professional. This is a legal professional who has deep knowledge of the law and legal skills, but who, is also, who also has a deep understanding of the social reality in which the law functions and in which the law often functions slightly different as the legislature or policymakers intended. Yet, as important as social legal scholarship is for our understanding of the law and the function of legal institutions, I will also highlight while talking about the T-shaped lawyer and about the development of the field as such, some challenges that social legal scholars have to face. And Ibu Sulis already referred to some of these challenges in her address. I will close today's lecture with illustrating the value of social legal insights based on some of my own research. But first of all, a short introduction into the field of law and society. The title of this speech uses the word endeavor, which means something along the lines of trying very hard or making a serious determined effort. This alludes to the fact that the social legal scholarship or that social legal scholarship is not always easy to do or easy to position within law schools. One of the reasons for the challenges that social legal scholars might face is the interdisciplinary and empirical nature of the research. But another reason is the image that social legal scholars sometimes have as not being seen as real lawyers. This is something that I, even in the Netherlands and in Leiden Law School still experience as well. Looking at the type of questions that social legal scholars ask and the methods that they apply to find answers to these often critical questions, it can be understood why they are sometimes seen as somewhat strange by their doctrinal colleagues. Yet, when looking at the roots and the history of social legal scholarship, it is crystal clear um, it is crystal clear the need to apply a different lens to legal phenomena and legal institutions um, comes from legal scholars themselves. They felt at a certain point in time the necessity to ask the question, to what extent does law actually deliver its promise? With societies changing and becoming more complex and more diverse, it became more and more pressing to look whether or not laws and rules made by the state were indeed contributing to a better, a well-organized, equal and legitimate society. By empirically studying how and why certain rules and regulations come into effect, who are driving these legislative initiatives, and also how society is being affected by these rules and regulations, the field of law and society aims to shine light on that very difficult question. You might have noticed by now that I am using both the term law and society and the term social legal scholarship interchangeably. Although some scholars have indeed highlighted some differences between the two, for me, both terms indicate the same approach in terms of questions, theories, and methods. Both terms indicate the empirical study of the law that critically examines the influence on the law of forces outside the box of legal logic. Now let us look back to the early days of social legal studies, which brings us to the beginning of the 20th century when legal scholars in Europe and the United States started to move beyond a purely doctrinal study of the law. In Europe, the collaboration between legal scholars and social scientists intensified as a result of the expansion of the administrative state. This collaboration served to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of policy and law, both instruments of social control. In the United States, where social legal jurisprudence and legal realism gained traction, 
Legal scholars also developed an interest in the impact of law, but in doing so, they mainly focused on the effects of judicial decisions. In addition, legal realists wanted to better understand the human determinants of court rulings. Contrary to the belief that these decisions were the outcome of mechanical application of legal principles to actual cases, legal realists argued that judicial decisions were made by human beings who were themselves subject to all kinds of norms, beliefs, and emotions that could affect the outcome of particular cases. In looking for answers to these questions, legal scholars, legal realists, came to see that they needed social scientific research methods. In the light of increasingly growing complexities and inequalities in society, now leading legal and social legal scholars such as Lawrence Friedman and Stuart Macaulay argued that the study of black letter law was too limited, partly in light of discrepancies between, and I quote, what the law said and what people were actually doing, and that there was a need to make law schools a more critical place. This wish initially translated into an increase of, on the one hand, so-called gap studies, and on the other hand, studies focusing on the operation of formal legal institutions. Building on legal realism, many law and society scholars focused on the identification and understanding of gaps between law in the books and law in action. This focus was importantly informed by legal, not social science assumptions, that law on the books and law in action are generally aligned, and thus their surprise about the fact that, very often, there is in fact a great discrepancy between the two. By researching the gap between the claims of law and its practices, and importantly the space within that gap, law and society scholars became part of the mainstream of contemporary scientific and humanistic inquiry. Although scholars often produced findings about the law in action that challenged the most fundamental premises of the legal scholar, the research was not motivated by an overarching question, uh, questions grounded in social theory. They rarely pursued the relationship of these legal practices to macro transformations of modern society. Whereas until today, scholars both within and outside the Law and Society Association or movement link law and society research with the study of law and action, it is clear that the lack of grounding of these gap studies in social theory as a and as a result of this lack of theoretical grounding, the early assumption driving these studies that social behavior is commonly in line with legal prescripts was problematic. So in other words, the fact that people researching the gap between law and society, law in the books and law in action weren't questioning um, the assumptions underlying the law as an instrument of norm, uh, you know, like norm setting and norm and, and, and it could be the behavioral control was seen as problematic. In explaining this problematic nature of Emeritus African law professor and renowned scholar in social legal studies, Richard Abel, reasoned that the assumption of harmony made sense. So the assumption of harmony that people actually will follow the rules. Um, and so he says this actually, when you believe in that assumption, that only makes sense in an era in which legislation still expresses and clarifies values that are already imminent in society. And when adjudication merely reasserts the values enunciated by previous judges, but in a time in which the actions of those who govern must be seen as making a difference, a difference phrased in the terms of the realization of goals, not just the expression of values, the assumption is less obvious. Now let us turn to the focus on formal legal institutions, because as I said, besides studying the gap between law in the books and law in action, the early social legal scholarship also tended to focus predominantly uh, on the operations of courts, lawyers, juries, and to a lesser extent, the police. 
In search of a law and society canon, Carol Saran and Susan Silby, two well-known uh, law and society scholars, indicate that students of law and society have historically pursued the study of law in action um, through formal legal institutions. In their eight or in his 80, in his 1986 presidential address for the Law and Society Association, student Macaulay lamented the preoccupation with legal actors. He was very critical of the predominant focus of studying only formal legal institutions. He says, my case is very simple. I will argue that we must look beyond the behavior of judges, lawyers, cops, crooks, and eyewitness, as well as beyond data concerning how many of what kinds of cases come before the courts. We need to understand the behavior of people, people who comply with or shade and evade the law. We need to consider why people turn to lawyers or use other means of solving problems. We need to understand what conduct by legal officials will applaud or tolerate, or what conduct legal officials people will applaud or tolerate. To understand these and other things, we must understand people's knowledge of and attitudes towards the legal system. Legality is situated and contingent on the particularities of time and place. In studying the formal institutions of the law, scholars capture the importance of nuance, context, contingency, time and place. But in studying sites beyond the formal institutions of legality, Law and society scholars started to reveal that the activities of doing law occur far before the law actually begins. That is, law is in society. Law is laced through, between, and in society's culture. The growing awareness among social legal scholars of the messiness of the law in action and the sometimes empty promise of the law has made law and society scholarship grown increasingly more critical of the law and legal institutions. So by the 1980s, law and society critics of positivism raised serious challenges to the positive of positivist paradigm and articulated post-realist interpretive and constitutive approaches to law. According to Kitty Calavita, in this more doctrinal approach, Law is seen as more or less as a more or less coherent set of principles and rules that relate to each other according to a particular logic or dynamic. The object of study in jurisprudence is this internal logic and rules and principles that circulate within it. According to this approach, law comprises a self-contained system that, with some notable exceptions, works like a syllogism with abstract principles and legal precedents combined with the concrete facts of the issue at hand, leading deductively to legal outcomes. It is, put differently, mostly devoted to examining what takes place in what Calavita calls inside the box of legal logic. Law and society scholars see this more formal study of the law as inadequate to explain law as it is experienced and lived in and through society, as I just mentioned. In order to examine this, law and society research adopted an external perspective on the law. It examines the influence on the law of forces outside the box of legal logic. Some of the central claims underlying this external perspective of law are that the meaning of law is not intrinsic to statutes or cases, but rather is dependent on extra legal factors such as political and social context. A second uh, claim underlying the external perspective of the law is that the form, the interpretation, the enforcement and the impact of law tends to reinforce, reinforce the extant social structure. And a third assumption is that the sources of law are themselves socially derived. This is something that's Ibusulis referred to while talking about the importance of being aware of legal pluralism and the existence of semi-autonomous social fields within society in which people attribute a much greater value 
to informal norms or customary laws and rules than to the rules of the state. The inside perspective on the law focuses on legal rules and procedures and sees rules and procedures from within the legal system. And it usually accepts these rules more or less at face value. As the social in social legal already implies, other than seeing the law as a closed system of logic, social legal scholars see law and study law as a tightly interconnected system with the context within which law exists be that a sociological, historical, economic, geographical, or other context. This is where one could perhaps see a moment of a more clear break, or at least a very present tension with hardcore positivist doctrinal lawyers. A moment where social legal scholarship seems to be shunned by legal scholars and a time in which social legal scholars are increasingly having a hard time in law schools. So the moment where social legal scholarship actually becomes more critical and less focus on just serving legal scholarship in um, researching the previous mentioned gap between the law and the books and law, uh, uh, law in action. It is understandable like, to, that this tension might happen because social legal scholarship at face value, if you don't look beyond what it is that social legal studies are actually trying to, um, uh, you know, like to, to, to develop or to lead into. If you look at it very flatly, you could be seen as social legal scholarship attacking the very core of legal scholarship, not only the claims of the legal system, as well as its workings in practice, in practice were being criticized and questioned but also the theories and the methods that were applied by social legal study, social legal scholars came from social sciences and not from the legal field. An interdisciplinary approach in which the knowledge of the law, but also knowledge of other disciplines was necessary, became prevalent in social legal scholarship. And this approach is not for everyone and is not understood by everyone. Yet what is important to know besides what we've just seen to be aware of the roots of social legal scholarship coming from the study of the law, that social legal scholarship nowadays has become or has turned into what some scholars have referred to as a big tent and a big tent where lawyers are welcome and needed. So the shift towards a more critical scholarship and the move away from focusing only on formal legal institutions by focusing also on people per, people's perceptions and experiences with the law contributed to a further transformation of the field of social legal studies into a very interdisciplinary and methodologically eclectic movement, sometimes referred to as a pluralistic association, or I just mentioned it already, a big tent that is only getting bigger all the time. Scholars from a broad variety of disciplines, sociology, anthropology, public administration, political science, criminology, and of course law, are joined together in their quest to better understand the way in which rules and norms operate in the world, and very often how they don't. Looking at law and society scholarship nowadays, and I'm basing myself on the literature as it is being published in leading journals combined with research um, that is presented at social legal conferences, two important characteristic traits of the scholarship need to be highlighted as they may play a role again in still explaining the, uh, the somewhat felt tension between legal doctrinal scholarship and social legal scholarship. In many ways, the two characteristic traits are a reflection from the earlier shift that I just mentioned towards what I would call a more cynical and a more critical take on and a perception of the law and legal institutions. Attention to state law and formal legal institutions has, as we've learned, always been central to law and society scholarship. But over time, scholarly interest in non-state law increased. To be sure, non-state law was a principal object of investigation in legal anthropology already before the organization of the law and society movement. But in the early years of law and society scholarship, 
legal anthropologists were not as visible and influential in the formal organization of the law and society movement as they would later become and still are. The increasing prominence of legal anthropologists in the Law and Society Association and the expansion of research on legal pluralism from colonial contexts, old legal pluralism to the developing world, new legal pluralism paved the way for or implied a broader approach to the study of law and legal institutions. Felice Levine also reflected on this issue and she wrote, the centrality of the law has always been an issue of tension in social legal studies. In order to understand law, our scholarly work must not only focus on isolating and explaining patterns of departure from law, but also look at law in different locales. Coming to understand what law with a little l in everyday lives is consistent with calls that date back to the 1960s and early 1970s. While the call is not new to focus on law with the little l, so more or less these informal norms and rules and regulations, it has been endorsed more readily in principle than in practice. One explanation of this ambivalence may flow from the influence of legal scholarship and the apprehension that a broader definition of boundaries might strip the legal field of a field. Despite initial concerns about attention to what law with a little l um, uh, might be and might do, non-state law and informal rules have taken up a very prominent role in contemporary law and society scholarship, and rightly so. In addition to the consideration of non-state law, social justice has also become a more central concern in law and society scholarship. Where the early research focused on, and I'm keeping, keeping, re keep repeating this, uh, mostly on these formal legal institutions, contemporary social legal research tends to focus more on questions of justice, questions of rights, questions of oppression and inequality. As I will explain a little bit later on, this focus can be understood through the lens of macro sociological shifts in society through which we are more aware of what is happening in the world around us, and as a result of which the implications of transnational phenomena are experienced and felt on a global level. In other words, this growing awareness of injustices around the globe, whether it being on an international, national, or local level, has also seeped into social legal scholarship, which makes sense, as I mentioned earlier, that social legal scholars already in the 70s started to question the extent to which state law and formal legal institutions were actually at the service of justice and equality, or maybe not. This warrants an increased focus on justice, rights and oppression and inequality as such. Law and society's commitment to social justice also connects to a concern for progressive social change. This concern does not only manifest itself in research that is informed by questions related to justice and equality. It also transpires in calls for policy-oriented research and engagement with activism. That is calls for contributing to the resolution of injustices identified by the research. Such an active role, whether it is an activist role or a more policy-oriented role can be and often is looked down upon or at least questioned by other scholars. The most important question, or I might even say recrimination, that social legal scholars who have taken on one or both of these roles have to respond to is the extent to which this makes their work less scientific, as if they would not no longer be objective. Without wanting to start the more fundamental discussion on whether or not there actually is something such as objective research to begin with, being socially engaged, whether through activism or contributing to policy briefs and or policy evaluations, in itself doesn't stand in the way of also being an independent and ethical scholar. In fact, there have been widespread debates in the fields of sociology and criminology in the Netherlands, in the UK and beyond, in which the question was asked to what extent scholars in these disciplines shouldn't feel and take the responsibility to be more 
public, the latter term referring to being more socially engaged and socially oriented in a sense that makes clear what the results of their research can contribute to society at large and also to more actively engage with civil society actors. With the law playing such a pivotal role in society, it seems logic to also have legal scholars be a little bit more socially engaged and oriented. The latter also seems to be in line with current debates in legal education on the necessity of creating and educating a more T-shaped legal professional. Being aware of the interactions between law and society and being aware of the ways in which legal norms and rules are envisioned by, as envisioned by the legislature in practice can play out very differently or not at all is of great importance to all legal professionals. Social legal insights and reflections are not just to be acquired by those who choose an academic career. Knowledge of social legal theories and methodologies is of key importance to all students that choose to go to law school and who will end up in any legal professional role. Remember the, the quote by the justice of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands claiming that he'd wish by looking at the variety of legal professionals he encounters in the Supreme Court that they would have had a more social legal orientation during their education. Legal theory, theory aimed as explaining the nature of law, depends on empirical social legal research to keep it grounded in experience and sensitive to social variation. Whether it is about understanding sentencing disparities, why do certain suspects get different or harsher sentences than others, or whether it's about how people's perception of the law and their perception of the justness of legal procedures can affect their willingness to comply with the law and why people belonging to certain semi-autonomous social fields can actually attribute more value to customary law than to formal state law and why this should be okay, but also where this can cause some interesting tension are issues that legal scholars should be concerned about. The current COVID-19 regulations that have been implemented by governments across the globe serve as an interesting study object for law and society scholars, not only from the perspective of compliance and legal consciousness, but also from the perspective of social movement theory as the anti-COVID movements across the world are gaining traction and are using litigation to contest the government's decisions. The fairly recently spurred Black Lives Matters inspired protests that happened in countries across the world addressing structural injustices in societies, furthermore shown light on the reality that having a rule of law, a rechtsstaat, a negara hukum, doesn't stand in the way of having laws in place that are aimed at oppressing and controlling groups within that rule of law. When discussing these and many other examples in my Law and Society course, which is an elective for law students at Leiden Law School, I often hear back from students that they are rather shocked by the fact that they are learning about the reality of the law and legal institutions, as they put it in their own words, is something that isn't part of the mandatory curriculum for legal students, but that it's only there for those who choose to take the course. A student told me, I feel so naive for not having questioned the extent to which the law is successful in achieving its various goals. Another student said, I wish that all my fellow students has, have the chance to take this course, if only they knew. The value of the social legal lens is not just something that is felt by students. In 2014, the directors of five big Dutch law firms called out the need for a new type of legal professional, the T-shaped, client-loving law entrepreneur. The topic stirred quite some discussion amongst legal scholars who were all trying to make sense of what this T-shaped legal professional should and could look like. In describing the T-shaped lawyer, I will draw from my colleague, Professor Elaine Muck's inaugural lecture on the matter. Um, and she wrote a beautiful book in which she 
further, uh, um, you know, like elaborates upon what the legal, uh, what legal education could do in order to um, stimulate legal education to actually contribute to the creation of this T-shaped legal, legal professional. The idea of the T-shaped lawyer originates from the United States, which is in the light of the strong legal realist movement, as we discussed, not very strange. The call for a new type of legal professional emerged some years ago in response to some of the challenges that were also mentioned by Ibu Sulis, um, amongst which technological developments, changes in the market for legal services, and new ethical dilemmas for lawyers in more complex societies. The T-shaped legal professional, it is argued, and that's what the illustration on the PowerPoint uh, um, and like it tends to signify the T-shaped lawyer is able to cope with all these new challenges based on, on the one hand, deep legal knowledge, like the pillar of the T, the vertical column of the T, combined with broad knowledge of other disciplines and academic skills, allowing for collaboration, the horizontal column of the T. In explaining how the T-shaped legal professional emerged, Muck points at two major shifts. One concerns a change in organizational demands, the other a change in societal challenges that affect the work of legal professionals. Under the influence of theories of new public management, the rule of law-based orientation of legal professionalism increasingly had to be combined with economic values concerning the effectiveness, efficiency, and transparency of professional performance. In this new image, organizational awareness and competition entered the picture. The legal professional status depends on the deployment of a body of genuine, specialized, socially valuable, knowledge-based skills. In this image, the law, firm, law firms become bigger and develop specialist services, in particular in the areas of civil and commercial law. In the judicial system, concentration of cases and the training of specialist judges increase in order to keep up with the growing substantive complexity, for instance, or for example, in intellectual property law or economic criminal law. Legal scholarship starts moving away from the legal practice under the effects of a demand for a more scientific research approach, which favors external perspectives on the law, such as law and economics, law and psychology, and law and society. A second shift in the image of legal professionalism has occurred with the increased complexity of society, especially since the year 2000. We live in an increasingly interconnected world where the global has become the local and in which everything and everyone is connected with each other. Today's lecture is an illustration of the fact that we are living in an online network society in which trends of digitalization and globalization have introduced drastic changes to the types of legal questions that arise and to the ways of approaching these questions. Secondly, the network society is also visible in the expansion of European, international, and trans-border legal issues and rules. In this regard, the function of the law as a lever for realizing change in society is receiving new and influential meaning in the global context and under the effect of values that have become more prominent there, such as social justice, sustainability. With regard to these types of cases, legal professionals are challenged to consider more complex societal issues from a holistic and integrative perspective, where they draw and integrate knowledge from a broad variety of academic disciplines and adopt a broader societal look. As Muck observes, these contemporary demands come together in a new image, which focuses on the qualities of technological awareness, non-legal competences, and social responsiveness of legal professionals. Firstly, this image emphasizes the need for broader knowledge and skills, as well as a more human-centered attitude. A central claim is that legal professionals cannot do without interdisciplinary competences, in order to deliver legal advice, judgment, and research that is tailored to the need of individual citizens as well as the wider society.
Furthermore, investing in relations with clients, persons involved in court procedures or other research group is essential in order to remain relevant in a larger and more competitive mark, market for legal activity. In developing the T-shaped legal professional, it is clear that social legal scholarship can play and has to play a crucial role. Social legal scholars understand the language of the law, yet they are also able to offer a wider perspective to the law, as well as a more public orientation and critical awareness of the social injustices the law can contribute to, but to which the law could also be an answer. So far, I have aimed to illustrate the importance and added value of social legal scholarship to the study and education of law and jurisprudence. In this last part of my lecture, I will illustrate how I use the social legal perspective in my own work and how it, it, how it has guided me and what I have gained from these insights that I would have missed otherwise. So two illustrations. Um, and if there are any people who, after these short illustrations, because I am not going to talk at great length about my research, but if there are any people who are interested in reading more, um, there's a little booklet that I published a couple of years ago um, that brings together these, these two examples also around an important topic for social legal and legal scholars, the topic of discretion. Do the traditional legal scholars claim that law can be explained through the close reading of texts, its own printed materials, the turn of the century law and society scholar responded that law must be understood empirically as it is practiced and implemented in various formal and informal institutional settings. In my own research, the importance of the social legal perspective can be best illustrated through the case of Dutch counterterrorism legislation and what has come to known as the process of immigration the merger of crime control and migra migration control. Let's start with the counterterrorism case. In my dissertation, I analyzed the development of Dutch counterterrorism, or better said, the lack thereof until after the attacks of 9-11. By carefully tracking and tracing the decision-making process of the Dutch legislature through a critical discourse analysis, an interesting image arose that initially largely escaped the attention of legal scholars. Guided by international pressures, fear, and a lack of information and knowledge on the nature of this perceived new terrorist threat, the Dutch government rather hastily implemented an impressive amount of counterterrorism measures, all falling under the scope of criminal law. Despite serious pushback and criticism from legal scholars, but also from key legal institutions, such as the Council of State, the country's highest advisory body on any new piece of legislation, the government continued with the implementation of a broad variety of actuarial criminal justice measures by both criminalizing potentially risky terrorist behaviors and introducing widely discretionary powers attributing a lot of power to law enforcement and intelligence agencies that were said to be at odds with human rights and civil liberties. Not looking beyond the letter of the law would not have allowed me to see the international and national power struggles behind the legislative procedure, as a result of which the civil liberties and personal freedoms of a few particularly Dutch Muslims, were surely sacrificed in return for the unsure safety of the rest of the country, as it was clear that it was that group that would be bearing the brunt of these measures. Insights from the field of criminology on labeling and the field of law and society on procedural justice and legal consciousness furthermore showed how these types of measures, without there also being a good functioning oversight system in place could actually lead to an increase in the very problem the measures aimed to address, so an increase in the risk of terrorism. The recent events in France, but also in Germany and other European countries that have implemented similar 
and often even more stricter and invasive counterterrorism measures seem to illustrate that the law isn't making much of a difference in countering terrorism. Terrorism and the legislation put in place to fight this terrible phenomenon give rise to an array of social legal questions that needs to be asked in order to even begin to start to adequately address it. As counterterrorism legislation is one of my areas of expertise, I could definitely go on talking about this topic for hours, but for the sake of time, I will present you with the second uh, example of what social legal scholarship has brought me in talking a little bit my, about my other area of expertise, the area of crimigration. Understanding the notion of crimigration in itself requires a social legal approach. In 2006, a U.S. lawyer, Juliet Stumpf, identified a couple of shifts in criminal law and in immigration law that led her to the conclusion that criminal law and immigration law at times seemed to be less distinct legal fields that they perhaps should be, given the fact that migration law is administrative and criminal law is criminal law. This seemed to be particularly the case when dealing with matters around irregular migration, but also broader in the context of migration control at large. Not only did she observe an increase in the criminalization of migration offenses, but also that the immigration consequences, but also that immigration consequences, such as expulsion and deportation, were attributed to criminal offenses. On top of that, she observed how in practice, in the context of law enforcement, but also in the context of detention, immigration practices no longer seem to differ a lot from criminal justice procedure uh, procedures. Whereas Stumpf, from a more legal perspective, goes on to understand the implications of these developments for the individual legal protection of migrants, social legal scholars have gone a step further in asking the how and the why question. How was it possible in practice that these two areas of law had become so blurred? And why was this happening? By studying the law in action, it has become clear that the role of street level bureaucrats and the various creative ways in which they use their eclectic toolbox of powers in funneling migrants into the criminal justice system has been crucial in explaining the how. And what I mean with by studying the law in action um, is I'm referring to you know, like the hundreds of hours that I spend in the field with the Dutch military and border police, for instance, in the case study that I did in the Netherlands, to literally observe the question, how are they applying their powers? What are the reasons behind pulling over one car over the other? Why are certain people receiving a fine or um, being placed in custody, whereas other people are just being reprimanded and are then being let go? So studying the law in action in this particular research for me was really doing ethnographic field work. In finding an answer to the why, why is this happening? We have to move from the micro, so from the street level to the macro, to the societal, in, in order to understand how globalization and the rise of so-called risk societies have fueled societal anxieties and a growing fear of the immigrant or the crimigrant other, who people are fearing that they will come take over the culture of countries and therefore need to be controlled. When we look at, for instance, the Brexit vote in the UK, that choice to no longer be part of the European Union was largely driven by this fear of migrants who, who would be able to easily come to the UK um, because of the open borders in the European Union. Now, I could go on for hours to talk about um, the, uh, the misconception of open borders in Europe. I won't do that, I'm more than happy to answer questions about that during the Q&A, but all to say that, like in order to understand this merger of crime control and migration control, we have to look more on a larger scale at like what are the anxieties that are prevalent and present within society that are driving these political choices. I come to a closing. 
In this address, I reflected upon the field of law and society and the interdisciplinary scholarship that is so illustrative for the field. Other than what is often thought, the field of law and the law and society has not developed apart from legal scholarship. Quite the contrary, law and society research was instigated by legal scholars, legal realists, who felt the pressing need to study the world of the law in action. Studying law in action led to the application of new methods and theories as a result of which the field of law and society quickly developed in such a way that doctrinal legal scholars felt increasingly disconnected from the eclectic and critical field of law and society. And that disconnect is too often still felt by social legal and legal scholars in law schools. Although this lecture has clearly been a promotion for social legal research, it doesn't imply that social research, or I don't intend to imply that social legal re research should replace more traditional or is better than more doctrinal legal research. Again, quite on the contrary, more traditional legal research may not only or not only serves a purpose on its own, since it addresses different types of questions compared to social legal research, it also serves as an important source of input for social legal research. In line with the introduced figure of the T-shaped legal professional, I am convinced that the conceptual and epistemological lens through which the law is studied can be enriched by conversations that cross legal disciplinary and methodological boundaries. Social legal scholarship still quite, or still has quite an inroad to make in law schools outside of the United States, and to a lesser extent, the United Kingdom. It was not until 2016 that in Leiden, a full-time position for a professor of law and society, this one, was reintroduced. And while looking at the country of the Netherlands at large, I believe that there are still only two full-time professors in law and society, not in general, of course, but in this field. Also, as I stated earlier, studying law and society in the form of a course of sorts is not part of the mandatory curriculum in Leiden. It is an elective only open to those students who already have a thirst for something more than just the study of the law. This is, of course, better than nothing, but as the discussion about the development of the field of law and society, as well as the discussion about the T-shaped legal professional illustrated, we also should feel a responsibility as legal educators to prepare our students as best as we can for the increasingly complex societies that they live in and have to operate within in whichever legal profession they end up working. Despite the fact that there's a long way to go in the Netherlands and many other countries when it comes to normalizing law and society in law schools, there are of course also very promising and hopeful developments looking at the Netherlands. The presence of departments of criminology within law schools and not in the faculty of social sciences, as is the case in many other countries, as well as a recent financial incentive by the Dutch government to promote the empirical study of the law, definitely make it easier for social legal scholars to gain foot on ground and to be taken seriously, both in legal education and in legal research. The next couple of years will be very interesting to follow in terms of seeing what this financial like input of focusing on the empirical uh, study of the law actually translates into. I'm looking forward to exchange and discussion with the audience, uh, but not before once again expressing my deep, deep gratitude to the University of Indonesia for giving me the opportunity to connect more with Indonesian students, scholars, and practitioners, and to show the importance and the added value of social legal research. As I said, I am looking forward to further collaboration in the hopefully very near future, both through research and education. I would also like to quickly thank the University Board of Leiden University and the Faculty Board of Leiden Law School for in fact reinstalling a full-time position in sociology of law and for their continuous support 
and efforts to further strengthen the position of social legal scholarship within the university and within the law, law school in particular. Lastly, warm, warm words of thanks to my Law and Society mentors from the Center of the Study and Law and Society at UC Berkeley, Malcolm Feely and Jonathan Simon. Not only did they introduce me to the field of Law and Society, without their continuous guidance and support, I wouldn't be where I am today. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm actually a bit speechless for your uh, thought provoking lecture, but uh, uh, one thing for sure, I would like to underline uh, your words about how it is possible for legal scholars working together with the uh, social scientists to work hand in hand to, to do uh, legal research and to see how law operates or, or not operates. But uh, before we go into the uh, question and answers session, I have one kind, remember, uh, kind reminder to our distinguished participants. Could you please fill in the uh, attendance form. And uh, for the uh, Wanita dan Hukum students, could you please add the word Wahum next to your name when you fill in the form. Terima kasih. So, uh, may, may I address you as Matya? Of course, <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> so, uh, we already have four questions. Okay. Yeah, uh, I will just read it one by one. Would you yeah. like to take it one by one or do you prefer me to read it? All of them. No, yeah, let's do it one by one because I saw them coming one. in and they're, and they're pretty lengthy. So I will forget if you read them all, all at once. <laughs> yeah, and very critical, which is good. Okay, good. I like that. <laughs> yeah, so the first one is coming from uh, Farina. There you and, are. Yeah, and uh, she said that... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of your expertise is on immigration in Europe and counterterrorism. So if you can give any comment about what happened in France and the new approach of Macron and Merkel about terrorism by Muslim immigrant, considering this is not the first terrorism happened, but a long tragedy happened a few years ago, but the president approach is very different with this recent terrorism. Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, to react upon that. Although I have to say, like, I, I of course, followed the news, right, about what happened in France, but I'm not uh, um, as detailed informed about that latest uh, latest attack as, as of, like, some of the previous ones. Um, but what I want to say about this is the following. Of course, what is very interesting to see or very interesting from through the lens of... Um, like what happened in this particular case is very unfortunate because it actually seems to um, confirm a, a big fear that people have, right? That through migration from uh, Syria, Tunisia, from the Horn of Africa, actually terrorist groups such as Islamic State are using those migration flows or the mobility of migrants who are in need to, uh, or in need of, or in search of a better life in, in the European Union, that terrorist groups are actually using those mobilities to, you know, like plant, uh, I don't know how you want to call it, like plant cells or at least like plan attack in, in the West. Um, I, I think in this particular case, it was fairly quickly known that the uh, attacker or the, the perpetrator who was arrested um, mm -hmm. had migrated or had traveled through Lampedusa, through Italy, from Tunisia to France, um, which... Of course, like I am not condoning any act of terrorism, but what I am warning for, and that is something that I will continue to warn, warn for, despite the fact that terrorist attacks have in fact, indeed, as also the, 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 um, the participant is highlighting, have be, been happening more in, in Europe. I think what is very dangerous is to too easily conflate these different categories, right? To not being able to distinguish between who are we talking about when we're talking about a terrorist and a terrorist is not the same as somebody who is fleeing their country 
um, because of economic or societal or warlike uh, warlike reasons. Um, so do I understand Macron's uh, a response to uh, want to forbid and criminalize all uh, you know, like houses of worship and like Islamic organizations? No, to be quite honest, because that implies that all these organizations without a critical assessment of what are they actually doing? Like, where does the money come from? What are the messages that are being shared within these communities that he is generalizing? Like he is painting two broad strokes that all these organizations are to be linked to potential terrorist attacks. And I find that problematic. So what I'm always asking for in any, uh, um, you know, like in any matter when, when addressing certain societal phenomena is to remain critical and ask the question, okay, what was this case all about? And how is that indeed, how can that be linked to the bigger picture that we have about terrorism? And I think terrorism is one of those problems that is just so complex that I think what, and that's why I highlighted it in my speech, very often we tend to go to, oh, we need more legislation. We need stricter rules when a terrorist attack has happened, right? And it makes sense because people are afraid the government needs to do something or feels they need to do something. But I think we can come to the conclusion that a lot of these measures that have been taken, they might result in putting people away in prison for longer than would normally be the case, but they really don't help in preventing terrorist attacks from happening. If you want to address the problem that is terrorism, you need to look at the root causes of it. And mm -hmm. criminalizing any form of behavior is not going to be any useful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I just want to say that this is a, a two way discussion. So it means that if uh, any one of you would like to raise uh, follow up questions or would like to raise any comments to uh, March's uh, lecture, please do so. And uh, Mungkin Prof. Satya ingin memberikan komentar terlebih dahulu, Prof. Oke. Oke. Halo. Halo. Oke, thank you very much ya. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Ya. Yeah. Yes. Ya. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oke. Okay. Ya. Yeah. Ya, yeah, uh, actually uh, how many person... Uh, people who have the same definition like you. I mean, in, in defining... Yeah. yeah, yeah. How many person like you uh, who, who have the same definition yeah, in defining the law and society interchangeably with the social legal? Is that the common uh, understanding? for all scholars or, or only some some yeah thank you yeah yeah thank you for asking that question i'm really glad that you ask uh, for, for the clarification because um and i, I said a little bit about it yeah, because yeah, the totally social right. legal scholarship or the field of um rech sociology um sometimes is seen as a little bit distinct or different than uh the field of law and society for me those fields are the same and that's very much in line with um I would say the broad definition within the law and society association. So the disciplinary association um, that brings together mm -hmm. most social, legal and law and society scholars across the world. What's interesting is that I will see the same people at the law and society meetings that are usually in the United States that I will see when I go to the social legal studies association, which is more the European uh, counterpart. So that's where you already see that despite these different labels, it's the same group of scholars. Yeah, uh, because actually I saw that so far within this, maybe around three, uh, 30 years, yeah, within these 30 years, uh, uh, some person uh, this Prof, maaf, putus-putus. So, yeah, but we don't understand uh, the correlation between uh, law and society. Yeah, for example, our late uh, lecture in criminal law, Mrs. Kustiani Siswa Subroto, 
uh, she wrote a, I think a dissertation under Professor Peters, yeah, A. a. G. Peters, yeah, mm. and also the other uh, like the late Antan Buyong Nasution also, but he he wrote in another university, I think, not 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 in Leiden, yeah, uh, in Utrecht, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, it's also uh, yeah. a city. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think uh, in the future, I think we need to uh, develop maybe like. Prof Satya, maaf suaranya uh, menghilang, Prof. Uh, dia uh, yeah. barangkali uh, Prof Satya videonya suruh ditutup dulu mungkin. Yeah. Uh, close, mungkin video videonya bisa. Uh, I think that uh, from your yeah. Ya, yeah, Prof. Maaf, Sorry? maaf suaranya tadi hilang. Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. Boleh diulang? Yeah, mungkin yang ya. Yeah. <laughs> Putus-putus. Bagaimana? Lupa saya. Yang yang uh, yang, yang terakhir, tanya. yang terakhir, Prof. Setelah uh, yang jadi Profesor bilang tadi kan Prof Satya bilang ada yang pernah menulis disertasi dengan pembimbing langsung dari Belanda. Nah setelah itu. Putus-putus, Prof. Oke, okay, ya. Yeah. Bang Buyung, Prof. Uh, ya. Bang, yeah, Buyung, Bang Prof. Buyung, Prof. Yang Buyung, and also uh, the late uh, Miss Kusriani Siswa Subroto. Uh, hmm. He wrote, uh, I think, a dissertation oral with Professor E.G. Peters. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's, I think, that's on, on law and so Conference. I remember in 2000. Of, mungkin. Interested uh, in this issue, but uh, saja. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Mungkin uh, kalau kameranya dimatikan, <laughs> maaf. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because Karena tadi masih putus-putus. Yeah. Because this is at the same time I I have a class now. I'm sorry, okay. but, but ah, okay. the different computer. I, I use my iPad. Oh. I have a class also. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Okay, I, I try to, yeah. Uh, as I if I as I have already said uh, within this uh, last 30 years, I I also saw some dissertation. Yeah, Indonesian uh, scholars who write a dissertation in the field of law and society. Mm -hmm. So I think in the future, we need to develop uh, some more activities and also uh, information. Uh, or if possible, maybe we can get like uh, with your Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, oh, of this pandemic COVID-19, but yeah, yeah. So, so in in uh, in general, I, I I mean, I need to, that we could uh, give more our or broaden our information on our law and society. So, in the future, maybe many people will more understand about about this uh, end of 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 studies. That, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Terima kasih. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Satya. And and we're we're really happy to hear that it's actually. I mean, it's it's been a long way that we in, in the history yeah. itself. Yeah, that we actually have done this kind of research before, coming to the roots of the rocks, uh, Rex Hoges Hall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, probably we can uh, continue with. Uh, Terima kasih, Prof. Satya. Sekali lagi. Uh, So I think we can uh, continue with the next question coming from uh, Ibu Widati. So uh, she said that during your lecture, you mentioned that from the social legal perspective, the influence of formal law is limited. What then is the consequence of this observation to the success of the use of state law as instrument for development or social change? Yeah, that's a very good and a very crucial question, of course, um, because that would mean that the law is not always the best instrument for social change. Um, and and like I, can, I have to nuance it a little bit because it depends very much on a particular uh, on a particular situation, whether or not law is actually the best way to solve a problem or to 
uh, like to create social trade uh, change. I think what the what law and society scholarship shows is actually, um, or what it actually, what it what it what it asks legislators, but people to be aware of, is the fact that we shouldn't always directly like look at law when there is a social problem, right? Because we should mm -hmm. first explore what is this problem. Where does it come from? Is it in fact a problem? Like, and who is labeling it as a problem? And you know, like, if it is, like, how can we then best address it? And as I explained, or as I mentioned uh, throughout my lecture, and also what was mentioned by uh, um, Ibu Sulis, is that sometimes we just have to admit that the formal law is not the most authoritative, authoritative. Uh, um, you know, like piece of information that people will listen to. If there are customary laws, religious laws, but also group norms be because of groups that people belong to that are seen as more important, you can create as many laws and legal provisions as you want. But if people don't believe in the law, if people don't respect the law, if people don't acknowledge the formal law, the formal law will never result in the change that people have in mind. And that's a very painful conclusion from a legal perspective where we have, and I, I am trained as a, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm, I'm an honorary judge besides being a professor. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, as a lawyer, we tend to believe that the law is, you know, we're going to fix it with the law. The law is the instrument to turn to. And social legal scholarship has actually shown us to be a little bit more humble, a little bit more careful in always throwing the law at, at problems. And especially in the context of terrorism, especially in the context of radical Islamist terrorism, which is a particular uh, um, you know, expression of many forms of terrorism that, that, that the world could know, especially with regard to this particular form of terrorism, um, these attacks, especially attacks uh, that are, 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 are carried out by members of or, or people that are, um, you know, have joined Islamic State, they don't, you know, they don't even acknowledge Western society, let alone Western legal structures. So they are not going to stop their attack because they know that they might end up in prison. So the law, in that sense, will never be a good way to prevent people who do not even believe in the, the, the system that has created these laws to prevent them from, from attacking uh, societies. So, yeah, it's um, a rather depressing conclusion uh, uh, for you know, like the question, what, what, what can state law actually do for societal change? It depends. That's the, that's the answer. It depends. Yeah. Uh, mungkin, uh, Widati, do you have any follow-up question or comments or? No, thank you, Dia. Thank you, Matya. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and and I think the next uh, question from uh, Mas Tristam is is in the line with this uh, discussion. Mas Tristam, he used to be. I mean, he is the former dean. Mm -hmm. of one of the life faculties in Indonesia and now he's the head of the master program yeah mas mm -hmm. yeah would yeah would you like to directly address your question to uh, marcha mm -hmm. uh, you can read it <laughs> already wrote <laughs> okay <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh mas tristan say what most people here in indonesia especially legal professors understood as social legal is rejected as n or as not a proper legal science. In this sense, is social mm -hmm. legal approach than scientific? I'm going to say something rather controversial <laughs> in return because I would say social legal scholarship is way more scientific then legal scholarship, and I would actually question, and I'm saying this jokingly because as I said, <laughs> I am a lawyer myself, to what extent can we speak of legal science? Uh, because when we look at social legal scholarship, that builds in its methodology on the fundaments of social sciences. So there are very strict 
rules and approaches on how to conduct a research much stricter than the very all often non-existing rules of legal science, which mostly come down to interpreting based on your own knowledge and your own interpretation, certain legal texts. And of course, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit coarse and drawing a little bit black and white lines here, but I think, because A, I don't think this is a discussion. Uh, um, I know that this discussion exists. I'm very aware of it. Um, I think it is oversimplifying the merits, or it's not oversimplifying, it is not um, taking into consideration the merits of legal scholarship, nor the merits of social legal scholarship. So it's trying to uh, minimize the value of these both distinct disciplinary fields. Law has its own value, social legal scholarship has its own value. Um, and they're just different. But if we would want to go so far as asking the question, which one of the two is more scientific, then I, the lawyer that I am, would say social legal studies because it's built on the tradition of the social <laughs> scientists. I can see that Ibusulis is dancing happily <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, Master Istam, any respond? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I, I, I think he agrees. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a saying in Dutch, zwijgen is toestemmen. So staying silent yep. means actually agreeing. <laughs> Yes, and and I think that this question from Diaz is is also uh, related to uh, Master Istam's question. Uh, he asks, "Is it true that law and society concentration with interdisciplinary approach is only effective in academic matters? For example, how can we apply the T-shaped legal professional in daily practical law matters, especially in business law?" Yeah, it's an excellent question. And there is actually um, a beautiful article um, that talks more about the area of business law, which you know, like full disclosure is not my uh, background. I am trained as a criminal lawyer. Uh, but for instance, in business law, what is really important, as is shown by social legal research, is to understand the informal rules that are actually very important in how businesses operate with each other. Of course, there is the legal framework, um, you know, like contract law, for instance, that plays a huge role, but sometimes we see, and the article talks, for instance, about the car industry, but also about other big industrial areas where businesses are, you know, like trading, constantly having to work with each other. Um, and what they saw is that um, despite contracts being breached, so mm -hmm. like breach of contract happening a lot, that that didn't translate into a lot of formal legal procedures, whereas the contracts actually stated that if a contract is broken, then you can go to court, which made a social legal scholar look into the question, hey, what's happening? We have this perfect legal system, businesses spend a lot of time and money in drafting all these very difficult contracts, but nobody is going to a lawyer or nobody is going to court. What he found out by talking to people, by going into these businesses and saying, hey, what happened? Like I saw or I heard that your business partner actually like didn't uh, stick to the contract, yet there is no case. He found out that the soft rules that were present within the industry, namely trying to solve a conflict, you know, like first one on one by talking, were seen as more important, more valuable and also more useful than spending a lot of time and money by going to court and actually messing up very important business relationships. So that's a very practical insight from the field of law and society that I think if I were a young business lawyer, I would like to know, right? I would want to be made aware of the fact that, yes, there is this state law that dominates in my field, but it's also important for me to know and to, to find out what the informal rules are that sometimes are much stronger than the state norms. So that's a very concrete example. 
Yeah. Okay. And uh, as I understand, we also have uh, several PhD students joining us this afternoon. <laughs> For instance, we have Fahrizal, Mas Fahrizal, and Mas uh, Bilal. We also have uh, Widya here, and and Widya actually, uh, she has one question, but but I think I will let her ask directly to you. Mm -hmm. So, Widya, hi, hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Well, actually, I'm happy if you can um, read my uh, question, but yeah. I'm sorry for formulating my question a bit cryptically, but I would like to say thank you, first of all, for you, Marcia, for pointing out in the last, one of the last point of your presentation that uh, both doctrinal um, uh, research and uh, sociology uh, research, uh, both important and both cannot be sidelined because that's one of the way that uh, social legal uh, studies can uh, be um, welcomed very well. Uh, I know um, there are some of the problem here and there, and one of the different uh, country must have different uh, problem for the perception of the social legal studies. Well, my uh, next question is actually a bit related with the first question. It's about the uh, anxiety and the re society. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I so far that I understand the anxiety is really firmly related to the background of the. Uh, sociological and cultural background. Yes, uh, some things are uh, trying to be scapegoated as mm -hmm. the dangers, but I feel like um, in one society and the other society that danger that perceived can be true and can also be illusionary. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? <laughs> what, yeah, your... I think that's a really good question. And I think that also shows the importance of um, actually a sub sort of discipline or a substream within law and society, which is more about law and culture, right? You can never really fully understand the law without also paying attention to the cultural context within which um, it is being applied. The same holds for understanding um, people's fears and anxieties. You can't generalize to uh, you know, like all Western countries or all countries in the global North or all countries in the global South because different countries experience social phenomena in different ways. And I think with regard to, for instance, the, um, the fear of terrorism, when I look in the Netherlands, to give again a very, very concrete example, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, a law passed in the Netherlands that banished people from wearing a burqa, right? So they couldn't wear a, a, like a veil. Um, a long debate happened and it was very painful because in essence, the reason or the, the, the fear that was driving this legislative change was indeed the fear for terrorism, which is interesting because there you see how, and we didn't, thank God, I'm knocking on wood, we haven't had any major attacks in the Netherlands, right? Not anything like France or, and I don't wanna jinx it, but why I'm saying this is that there wasn't a concrete reason to be fearful of a group of only a hundred women on a national level that were actually wearing a burqa in public. Um, that's, I think, a very clear example where you see how the fear of terrorism in the cultural and national context of one country, the Netherlands, is taken too far, is taken to the level that we are now scapegoating everybody who we associate based on their religious background and the way people in freedom tr like choose to dress, uh, we're scapegoating them. In a country such as France, right, that has experienced a larger amount of very terrible attacks, and I'm not saying that they should uh, criminalize uh, um, these things in France, but I would say, or I feel comfortable saying that the way in which people experience the fear of terrorism in France is very different than the Netherlands because of the fact that people actually had to live through a, a, you know, like a series of the, these attacks in the, uh, in the recent future, which could indeed then justify an extent of that fear. Where things get really problematic, and I've argued that also in the context of other 
developments within the criminal justice system in the Netherlands is when the government says we are not just responsible for fighting crime, right, which is something that the government needs to do based on the rule of law and the fact that the government is responsible for making sure that people are safe from harm that is done against them by others. It becomes problematic when the government says, no, we are also going to make sure that everybody feels safe. Because then you're introducing a subjective element that is very different from, you know, like what I what makes me scared is different than what is fearful to you, right? So, but when you make that into formal policy, which happened in the Netherlands, then you enter a very slippery slope. Um, so yes, people can have some fears are are more. Um, I wouldn't want to say legitimate, um, but but more more real in some countries over the other. But I think in general, governing based on fear or having government decisions being influenced heavily by fear is always a bad thing. I don't know if I answered your question uh, that way. I cannot. Uh... I cannot help but think about the positionality. Well, it turns out that the positionality is not only important for the researcher, but also mm -hmm. for the lawmaker and the government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like of everybody. course. You no, know, yeah, we had, we just had a whole course about you know the 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 the, the difficulties of lawmaking. Yeah, it's very easy mm -hmm. for me to 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 say all this, and but the lawmaker is the one who's put in the position of on the one hand dealing with an acute situation. Um, people, uh, for instance, an attack happened, people are fearful, they are knocking on the door of the government, they want to see that action is being taken. It requires a lot of strength to, in those situations, say, wait a minute, let's take a step back, let's calmly reflect upon what happened. Um, that might be very difficult, um, but it's not impossible. Um, I think what needs to be what needs to become more of a practice is to not directly start up the legislative machine, but first, for instance, organize like an expert meeting with people from outside of the legislature who actually have uh, you know, specific expertise on the topic and could perhaps advise on what the best route to take is. Thank you, Marcia. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I somehow got <laughs> this. <laughs> because someone is jumping up and down. It's like you're, you're multitasking. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but uh, Marcia, I would like to make some follow up here, if if you don't mind, because the the uh, notion of positionality in this decision making process is is actually really important. Yeah, and and. Uh, I mean, at least in the class, some of the questions that we often got from the students are about the neutrality. I mean, we as researchers, to what extent this will reflect our neutrality. And also if we speak about, uh, for instance, uh, the objectivity of your own uh, research uh, in order to validate the data and so on and so forth. Do you have any comments about this? Yeah, I, I made a little bit of a, of a sneaky comment about objectivity, I think, in my in my lecture, saying I think it's, in, it's impossible, right, to, to yeah. have, be fully objective because of the fact that we have our, we bring ourselves into the, into the research. So therefore, reflecting upon your positionality and upon how, you know, like, who you are with your, you know, like, background, cultural, religious, political, background how that influences the lens through which you look at the reality that you're studying is always very important right so i think that also links back to the the, the scientific nature of social legal scholarship is acknowledging that and being transparent about that um, mm -hmm. because it makes a very big difference and i experienced that myself when i was doing the research with the dutch military and border police I carried out the observations together with two male PhD students, one of which very much looked like a student. Uh, like, you know, it was, uh, the other one was very like buff and he looked like a, basically looked like a wrestler. 
um, and, and it was me. We all received very different treatments. Like, and all of the information that we collected was different because we were bringing ourselves into that research. For instance, like I got all the gossip because all these men felt terribly comfortable like chatting with me about what was happening like uh, over a cup of coffee, right? Because how much fun is it to talk to the only women because I, I very often was the only woman uh, who was there. So I had to reflect upon and think about um, you know, like what it meant to, you know, like what my, 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 like me being a woman actually meant in collecting the data and how as a result of that, I might have collected different data than my colleagues. Because one of the male colleagues, the one that really looked like a wrestler, he was initially treated very hesitantly. Yeah, that's really funny, but it is. Because why? People thought he was, he was from internal affairs, that he was there to actually check them. And they didn't believe that he was a PhD student, right? So, so we had to work through, okay. And then like he like had, a, had to reflect upon that. So positionality, I think is a key topic in any type of research, but in particular also in social legal research. Um, but uh, I think we never should expect the, that we are able to be fully objective in the research that we do for the very reason that we always bring ourselves into the research. Thank you so much for clarifying that. And uh, wow, time runs. Yeah, I was <laughs> so many questions. Yeah, so uh, we have three more minutes. Mm -hmm. So if anyone, uh, mungkin, uh, perhaps uh, Tirta or, or Fahriza or, or Bilal would like to say something. I think that uh, Fahrizal and Bilal, like I talk to them so often. <laughs> right? I actually meet with Bilal in the afternoons. Tirta and Ifa then, please. Well, I don't know. Um, I'm still amazed by your lecture uh, today, Marcia, because um, it's very inspiring. It's very uh, mind opening. Um, even though I've learned about social legal for quite a long time already, but it's still amazing to hear how um, it is being uh, conducted out there and the discussion and the debate about it and how people are still questioning and we have to put ourselves at the very best of us to fight against those people who are not in the same um, perspective with us. And I'm also uh, intrigued by this um, lecture on how you do your um, field work, for example, your stories about being a woman. I mean, I can relate because it's, it's really influencing who you are when you do um, field research um, have different um, results. I don't have any questions. I'm just saying my biggest appreciation uh, for your lecture uh, today. Thank you so much, Marcia. Thank you. <laughs> what? You're mute. Yeah, you're muted. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terima kasih, Tirta. Yeah, I think I think uh, her, her opinion is. Yes, I think it's what, it's what most of us uh, are, are thinking right now. Uh, Ibu Sulis, you would like to add something? Oh, <laughs> Marcia, thank you very much. Thanks a million for valuable, meaningful, and fruitful lecture for all of us. And it strengthened our standing in uh, law and society so scholarship at our faculty and it gives us more confidence, mainly for young scholars like Tita, uh, Dia, Ifa, uh, to continue our legacy. So uh, in this regard, I'm looking forward to have more collaboration with you in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I agree. More collaboration and we're standing strong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's exactly six o'clock and, and I think some of us will go uh, to the uh, uh, night prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, once again, Marcia, hail, fail, dunk. 
geen dank. Het was een, een aangen- echt een plezier. Ja, voor ons ook zo, denk ik wel. En uh, Bapak, Ibu, teman-teman semua, so our distinguished uh, participants, once again, uh, thank you so much for all your comment and questions, or, or even being here with us this afternoon in this very interesting uh, discussion. And I hope this kind of uh, lecture or discussion can be, uh, be produced somehow mm-hmm. to other law faculties, mungkin Mas Tristan to Unpar, for instance, or, or even to Bengkulu. We also have Ibu Titi here. She's from uh, the University of Bengkulu. That is uh, one university on the other island, on Sumatra Island. Ah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, thank you so much. And, and Marcia, we hope to see you again soon. <laughs> me too, me too. Hopefully live and otherwise through, uh, through Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, selamat, si- uh, selamat malam semuanya. Terima kasih sekali lagi dari kami, dari Fakultas Hukum UI. Sampai berjumpa di lain kesempatan. Dan uh, mungkin ada masih ada pengumuman kah dari Do we have any announcement from the uh, panitia Mbak Tirta?